Even though it's a small group right now, I'm still going to go ahead and get started um, just because we have a lot to talk about this evening. Um, in fact, if everything kind of goes um, according to plan, <laughs> um, I'm hoping that a lot of the strings and threads that we've laid out come together. And so on that note, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective, and we're about to get into part eight of our deep dive study of the Sri Mala Devi Simhanada Sutra. Um, and I think actually because I haven't done it for uh, a while, I just want to, uh, and in fact, I think it's going to be important that I recap kind of the sutra up to this point. Um, you know, I've said this many times on Dharma doors that sutras in general are sort of intended to be read kind of in one sitting. And it's, you know, people have ideas about that, of why that is. Me personally, though, it's that, you know, these sutras can get rather dense and they're building and building and building. And if you take a step away and try to dry, dive right back into where you were, it doesn't kind of work that way. Um, and so I am going to kind of just remind us that we're talking about this um, Sri Mala Sutra as it's called in its shortest form. And that's the name of this, uh, the star, the, the main speaker of this sutra is Queen Sri Mala. And that's the name of the sutra. Um, we're on chapter five. And there's 15 chapters in this sutra. So it's taken us a while now. Um, and we're still kind of right in the middle of chapter five. Um, and so before we can kind of go any further, let's remind ourselves of how this went really, really quickly. Chapter one's easy. I spent a while on it, but it's pretty easy. It kind of sets up the, the, it sets the stage for the sutra. And what happens in that first introductory chapter is that Queen Srimala's parents, King Prasanajit and Queen Malika, they get this idea that their daughter is very wise, very bright. And so if she could see or kind of have an experience of the Tathagata, right, the Buddha, um, that she would understand the Buddha's teaching. And so the king and queen write their daughter a letter. And this letter, if we remember, is a letter praising the merit or punya of the truth, Buddha Tathata, of the Tathagata, praising the merit of the truth of the Tathagata, or the Buddha in that sense. But I want to start right away with reminding you that this sutra has a very kind of interesting understanding of the Buddha or Tathagata, thus come one. And what, what I mean is, is that after Srimala reads this letter, she seemingly has a vision in which she sees the Tathagata and then begins to, you know, in a kind of what it seems like a, a trance or kind of a state of ecstasy, she, Srimala, begins to recite a poem. And that poem is also kind of praising the merit of the Tathagata, the virtues of the Buddha in that sense. And she also sort of makes this, um, this final request to be accepted, to be received, to be padigraha. That's chapter one. And in many ways, it's an introductory chapter. There's not really anything that happens in that sense. It's really just setting up a lot of the ideas that then we will come to later on. Chapter two is where this sutra really identifies itself and presents itself as a certain type of sutra. And what I mean is, is that chapter two is Srimala then shifts gears out of reciting poetry, out of reciting these rapturous praises of the Tathagata. She shifts into receiving or taking, if we will, but receiving 10 precepts. 
And these are, I spent a whole night talking about these, but these are sort of additional observances or precepts that are sort of appropriate to the Bodhisattva path as we are to understand Sri Mala represents. And these 10 precepts, which, you know, you can think of them as, again, observances or even rules in a sense, it's, it's about kind of avoiding certain behaviors in that way. And so that kind of starts to put this sutra, um, well, within the framework of what would be called kind of a pure land sutra, which is kind of a big part of pure land sutras is about taking precepts or additional precepts, addi additional responsibilities in that sense. And then chapter three, after taking these 10 precepts, she, Srimala goes a step further and sort of makes three great vows. And then we are to sort of understand, or you could read that as chapter two and chapter three are sort of not preparatory per se, but there's a way in which taking those precepts and making those three great vows, Srimala is getting ready. She's getting juiced up to deliver the Dharma. And so that's kind of what's happening in two, chapter two and chapter three. Then we get to chapter four, which really be began Srimala's um, exposition or her explanation of the Dharma. And I wanted to remind you too, that in, in, in that sense, I wanted to remind you that this is Sri Mala Devi's Simhanada Sutra. This is the lion's roar of Queen Sri Mala. And so I sort of teased that idea out there during the beginning, like the first couple of nights, I really made it, I, I think I even spent a whole night on the idea of the lion's roar. I read older Pali suttas of where that idea comes from. Tonight is the night, though, that we come back around to that idea of the lion's roar. Tonight's the night that we come back around to that idea of the merit of the truth of the Tathagata. Also in chapter four, there were two little uh, nuggets that she dropped, that Srimala dropped, that didn't really get fully explained, but they were kind of teasers for ideas to come. The one idea, and I didn't spend too much time on it, I spoke about it a little bit, the one idea that got mentioned in chapter four is something called the Dharma body or the Dharmakaya. This is a, a really kind of important Mahayana Buddhist idea. And without kind of even getting back into it, because really she just mentioned it as a kind of superior goal, if you will, which is to sort of uh, uh, abandon or relinquish attachment to the physical body and to sort of take on this Dharma body. But she kind of left us hanging there with that idea of, of, of putting on this Dharma body. So we're not really fully, we don't fully understand that idea yet, but that's okay. And then the other thing that gets introduced in chapter four is Srimala starts talking about these different vehicles. In particular, she's ta she talks a lot about what is called the Arhat vehicle and the Pratyeka Buddha vehicle. Also sometimes called the Shravaka or voice hearer vehicle and the solitary enlightened one or the solitary enlightened path. So these are these two kind of potentially competing types of Buddhism that were alive and well at the, at the time of Queen Srimala. And they sort of represent these different paths or approaches to being a Buddhist. And I also have spoken about these in, um, I forget which part of this. So I don't wanna go too deep into these two and they're gonna come up again. So, but I wanted to remind you that the basic idea of a a voice hearer, a shravaka, a shravaka or a voice hearer is pursuing the arhat, 
path or is on the our hot path and the goal of that shravaka vehicle the voice here vehicle is to attain arhatship to become an arhat and this of course is still the goal if you will of certain types of buddhism that are still practiced in the world today in particular the branch or type of buddhism called theravada buddhism the way of the elders the way of Buddhism that's practiced in Southeast Asia, Sri Lanka, Thailand, the Thai forest tradition, all of those are kind of a arhat path. They are still a way of attaining arhatship. And so there's a way in which this sutra can be fully, fully read in a contemporary mode in which Sri Mala is telling us about Theravada Buddhism and those pursuing the Arhat path. And in addition to that, at the time of Queen Srimala, as well as today, there is this solitary Buddha path, the Pratekya Buddha path. And you can imagine basically a, a difference between these two, the Shravaka and the Pratekya Buddha. The voice hearer, the Shravaka pursuing Arhatship, they are also in this sutra and otherwise, they are often, that is often referred to as the path of learners, the path of students. And what I mean by that is, is that the idea is, is that they are in a way will always be subservient to the Tathagata or the Buddha because they rely upon the Buddha for knowledge in that way. That's different than the Pratekya Buddha. The Pratekya Buddha is this, this kind of, you know, rugged individual in that way that really just is not interested in institutions, not interested in hierarchies, not interested in groups in that way, meaning like churches, if you, if you want to use that term. And so the Pratekya Buddha is the vision or the idea of a way of doing Buddhism where you're off in the woods alone, meditating in a cave. Yeah, you're not a follower. You're not a student. You're alone in a cave practicing. And it seems like at the time of Sri Mala, way back kind of in the early days of Buddhism, it does seem as if Buddhism started to kind of split into these two predominant modes. One is a more churchy, hierarchical organizational mode where you get inserted into a program and that program is headed toward our hotship. And there are people who will pat you on the head and tell you when you've reached certain stages. And at a certain point, you will be deemed an arhat by somebody else who was deemed an arhat by somebody else who was deemed an arhat, but you're part of a hierarchy. So there was that way or mode of being Buddhist, it seems. And then there was this rugged individual mode of, of seeking Buddhahood, but totally alone in that way. Srimala introduces these two oppositional paths, these two different paths in chapter four. And she, started, she sort of starts to weave them into her discourse. That, or those, I should say, the, the Shravaka slash Arhat and the Pratekya Buddha, they start to become the focus of chapter five. And of course, you may remember that chapter five is called the Ekyayana, the one vehicle. And that's what Sri Mala has come to tell us all about is the one Buddha vehicle, the one vehicle, not two competing vehicles, certainly not three, four, or five, but one kind of supreme, superior, maha, great one vehicle. And so those ideas, the Dharmakaya, the Dharma body, the shortcomings of the Arhat and Pratikyabhuta, and then sort of this um, a grand idea of the one vehicle. All of, all of those various ideas, these, these little bits 
that Srimala has been laying out are, I hope, tonight, about to get woven all together into a very, very beautiful um, statement about the Dharma. So where we left off last time, again, we're, we're deep in chapter five, Srimala has been going off about the shortcomings of the Arhat path and the shortcomings of the Pratekya Buddha path. And in particular, what we have just come to, and this was the focus of part seven last Sunday, Srimala is basically starting to focus on what she calls the underlying defilement of ignorance underlying ignorance, this idea of avidya. And what she's contrasting avidya to, underlying ignorance, is various defilements of activity or karma. These, these are ideas, and this is what I talked about last time, clinging and desirous attachment to views, desirous clinging attachment to sensual pleasures, desirous clinging to form, the body of form, forms and shapes in the world. And then ultimately, the, one of the fourth defilements is actually clinging and desperately holding on to being, existing. And she says, is, even as strong as those defilements are, not to mention all of the various active defilements that arise from those four underlying defilements, she says all of that is nothing compared to the underlying defilement of ignorance. And that's what she starts to say is the problem or the shortcoming of the Arhat and the Pratekya Bhutta is that while they may have eliminated the four kleshas or four defilements that she outlines, um, views, sensual pleasures, form, and being. They may have overcome those defilements, but she says they have yet to overcome that ultimate defilement of ignorance. Then what she did last time, right as we were ending last time, is she starts to lay out a kind of a new, Mahayana understanding of the Four Noble Truths. And she basically starts to say that the Shravakas slash Arhats and the Pratekya Buddhas, they only have a partial or incomplete understanding of the Four Noble Truths. And she starts contrasting, and this is where we're, we're really getting close to like, tonight and not just review but the so the last thing she left us with was that idea that that their understanding their knowledge of the four noble truths is not complete because they have not cut off the underlying defilement of ignorance okay there's only one more idea <laughs> that i need to introduce and I inter it came up last week, but I, I didn't mention it. I just let it pass by. I just we couldn't we couldn't go there. But there was one idea that she mentioned that I want to start tonight with. And it'll if I kind of get this out of the way, I think it'll make the reading of this uh, rest of this or the next part of the reading very interesting. So the topic that she mentioned was Vajra wisdom. She mentioned the Vajra wisdom of the Buddha, or actually the, yeah, the Vajra wisdom of the Buddha. And I'm going to reread the section where this came up. It was right at the end. And, and usually, you know, things right at the end, you know, we've had a long night. And so I want to reread that section to make it fresh in our minds. But before we do, I want to make clear that we all know what a Vajra is that we're on the same page. So the sutra talks about the Vajra-like wisdom of the Buddha. And of course, I want you to know something very interesting. You may recall when I started the sutra that I mentioned that there are two existing Chinese translations 
that I'm reading both of them and basically kind of generating uh, a clean, fresh translation of my own. And I'm using both of these, although I'm only translating one of them, I'm using both of them for comparison and which is standard translator thing to do. And my point about that is, is that um, I've sort of gravitated back to reading from this version of the Sri Maladevi Sutra. And this is the version, of course, from our heap of jewels, the peak of jewels, the collection of sutras from which the Sri Maladevi Sutra comes. And the version that's translated in here is the earlier, the earliest Chinese translation by Guna Bhadra in 435, 435 AD. So that's the early version that is translated, uh, sorry, that, that I've been translating. And that is also translated by Diana Paul in the BDK tra uh, translation. The version in here that I've switched back to reading is actually from the later version of um, Bodhiruchi, which is actually closer to the year 800. 435, 800. That's a long time. That's a long gap. What's surprising is actually how few changes actually have been made from 435 to the year 800. It's actually kind of incredible. And it actually gives me a lot of confidence and faith in this process when so little has been changed over time. But there's one there are many, many interesting little differences between the two. And one difference is that if you read Diana Paul's translation from the earlier 435 version, it doesn't say Vajra wisdom of the Buddha. It actually just says awakened wisdom of the Buddha, the, the, what would be the Bodhi Jnana, Bodhi awakened and Jnana knowledge. So something happened between the year 435 and the year 800 when Bodhiruchi keeps calling it the Buddha's Vajra-like wisdom. And, you know, that sort of lines up with what we know about the lore, the Buddhist lore about the Vajra. And of course, you know, a Vajra is a thunderbolt or a lightning bolt. It's something that if you were going to um, imagine or illustrate or try to capture the, the, the symbol of a thunderbolt or a lightning bolt. This is what the Buddhists have come up with. So this is a Vajra. And of course, this was originally sort of the, the weapon of the god of the sky named Indra. This is not Indra, the god of the sky very similar to Zeus in the Greek tradition, who also has a thunderbolt weapon. Also similar to Thor in Norris mythology, who also has a thunderbolt weapon. <laughs> similar to Chango in the Yoruban Santeria tradition, god of thunder who carries a lightning bolt. So there's a theme in a lot of different religious traditions about a god of the sky who carries a thunderbolt weapon. In Buddhism, Indra, the god of the sky who carries the Vajra, in, in the Buddhist tradition, Indra actually gifts the Vajra to the Buddha, actually gives it as a kind of as a gift. And rather than using the Vajra to smote enemies, <laughs> the Buddha sort of meditates on the power of the Vajra. And, and of course, the Buddha is an extraordinary being for being able to wield and even hold a Vajra in that sense. But my point is, is that you may be more familiar with the translation of Vajra as a diamond, like the Diamond Sutra is actually the Vajra Sutra or the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra. And it's unfortunate because there's a lot of connotations and significance to Vajra. Vajra as lightning, 
Vajra as thunder, not Vajra as diamond. In fact, most of the metaphors concerning Vajra have to do with light, have to do with speed, and in particular, the one that I want to bring your attention to, the one quality of Vajra that's really, really at play tonight in, in the reading of this sutra is understanding that Vajras are indivisible. You cannot, you cannot split a Vajra into two. It's, it's sort of this symbol for, well, indivisibility, indestructibility, but ultimately it's a symbol for non-duality, for not split into two. And so what I mean is, is tonight when we get into the sutra and we hear about the Vajra-like wisdom of the Buddha, I think I would, I would like you to be thinking about it this way. My, 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 Michael, my mind is very dualistic. I think in terms of me and you, I was even now thinking in terms of me and the Vajra. So that's divided. That's me and it, me and you. And not only that, I do this thing, you may do it too, but I do this thing where the thoughts I have are one thing and me having them and me is another thing. Like there's me having these thoughts and that's also dualistic and divided in that way. What I'm getting at is there's a way in which my very knowledge my wisdom is very dualistic. It's predicated on here. It's predicated on a bunch of division. So when they talk about the Vajra-like wisdom of the Buddha, the suggestion is, is that the Buddha is not operating in a dualistic mode. And therefore, there is no separation between the Buddha and the thoughts of the Buddha. In fact, there's no separation between the Buddha and anything else in a way because that's the very kind of essence of non-duality is you can't split it into here and there, right? So just sort of be watching for that because it's not gonna say it explicitly, right? It's going to be within the larger discourse of this chapter. So I just want you to be paying attention to that use of Vajra. And I've strategically planned tonight to sort of open with the idea of this Vajra-like wisdom and if I can make it as far as I'd like to make it, we're going to conclude with this Vajra-like wisdom. Okay, before I get into that, any questions, comments, answers, or ideas about back chapters, back ideas, anything I just said? I don't want to leave anybody in the dark. Awesome. Of course, that was all review. Mm. Okay. So the pl place where I'm going to start reading um, and, you know, get ready to kick back because I think I'm going to be reading for a little while before I pause. Um, I want to remind you that where I kind of am going to pick up is this part about how the Arhats and Pratekya Buddhas have an incomplete understanding of the Four Noble Truths. They don't fully understand the truth of suffering. They don't fully understand the cause of suffering. They don't fully understand the alleviation or cessation of suffering. And they don't fully understand the path that leads to the cessation of suffering. So it's incomplete. However, she says, if one knows suffering completely, eradicates all causes of suffering completely, realizes the complete cessation of all suffering, and follows the path in its entirety, then one realizes the permanent, quiet, cool nirvana within an impermanent, decaying, corrupt world. World Honored One, such a person as that can be a protector and a refuge in a world where there is no protector and no refuge. 
How is that? One who sees high and low in things cannot realize nirvana. Only one who perceives equality in wisdom, equality in liberation, and equality in purity can realize nirvana. Therefore, nirvana is called the uniform one flavor. And what is that one uniform flavor? It is the taste of liberation. World Honored One, one cannot attain nirvana, that one uniform taste, if one does not completely eradicate and exhaust the underlying defilement of ignorance. How's that? Because if one does not do so, one cannot completely wipe out all the faults that should be wiped out, which are all more numerous than the sands of the Ganges River. And if one does not wipe out all faults, which are more numerous than the sands of the Ganges River, one cannot realize all the merit, which is also equally as numerous as all the grains of sand in the Ganges River. This being the case, the underlying defilement of ignorance is the breeding ground of all defilements that should be eradicated. From it arise all the defilements causing hindrances to the mind, hindrances to tranquility, hindrances to contemplation, meditation, samadhi, effort, wisdom, fruition, realization, power, and fearlessness. From the underlying defilement of ignorance arise all the defilements, more numerous than the sands of the Ganges River, that can be eradicated only by the Tathagata's enlightenment and the Buddha's Vajra-like wisdom. All active defilements depend on the underlying defilement of ignorance, for ignorance is their cause and condition. World Honored One, these active defilements arise from moment to moment in tandem with the mind. However, World Honored One, the underlying defilement of ignorance never arises in tandem with the mind. World Honored One, all the defilements more numerous than the sands of the Ganges River, which should be eradicated by the Tathagata's enlightenment and the Buddha's Vajra-like wisdom, all depend on and are established by the underlying defilement of ignorance. As an illustration, consider seeds, plants, and forests, all of which germinate and grow from the great earth. If the earth were destroyed, they would also be destroyed. Similarly, all the defilements, more numerous than the sands of the Ganges River, which should be eradicated by the Tathagata's enlightenment and the Buddha's Vajra-like wisdom, depend on the underlying defilement of ignorance for their existence and growth. Once the underlying defilement of ignorance has been cut off and severed, all those defilements more numerous than the sands of the Ganges rivers that should be cut off by the enlightenment of the Tathagata and the Buddha's Vajra-like wisdom will simultaneously be cut off. When the underlying defilements and active defilements of all things more numerous than the sands of the Ganges rivers, which should be cut off, have been cut off, one will be able to realize the inconceivable Buddha Dharma, which are also more numerous than the sands of the Ganges river. One will penetrate all dharmas without obstruction, become all knowing and all seeing, free from all faults, achieve all merits, and become a great 
Dharma ruler who has gained mastery of all dharmas and who has realized the state of free command of all dharmas. That person will be able to make the true lion's roar. I have ended my rebirths. I have fully cultivated pure conduct. I have done what should be done. I am no more subject to samsaric existence. This is why the world honored one constantly makes his firm proclamation in a lion's roar based on the ultimate truth. Okay, I am gonna pause there. That was a lot. Everybody doing okay? All right, so we get, we get what's going on. That's a good sign. World honored one, Srimala continues. The knowledge of being no more subject to samsaric existence is of two kinds. What are the two? The first knowledge belongs to Tathagatas. The Tathagatas have vanquished with their harnessing and subduing power, the four Maras have transcended all worlds and are esteemed by all sentient beings. They have realized the inconceivable pure Dharma body, the Dharma Kaya, have attained mastery in all fields of knowledge, are unexcelled and supremely magnificent have nothing more to do and see no further stages to realize, are endowed with the 10 powers, have ascended to the supreme stage of fearlessness, observing all dharmas without hindrance. Therefore, they can make the true lions roar, proclaiming that they are no more subject to samsaric existence. The second knowledge of being no more subject to samsaric existence belongs to the arhats and pratekya buddhas. They have been released from the fear of countless births and deaths and are enjoying the bliss of liberation. Therefore, they think, I have left frightful samsara far behind and will suffer no more pain. World Honored One. By making this observation, Arhats and Pratekya Buddhas also, also claim that they are no more subject to samsaric existence. However, they have not realized the highest state of relief and rest, nirvana. On the other hand, if they are not deluded by the Dharma that they have realized, they will be able to understand that there are states that they have not yet realized, saying to themselves, ah, now I have only realized an incomplete state. And they will definitely attain supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment. How so? Because the vehicles of the Shravakas and the Pratekya Buddhas are both included in the Mahayana. And the Mahayana is the Buddha vehicle. This being the case, the three vehicles are the one vehicle. One who realizes the one vehicle attains supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. Supreme unsurpassable enlightenment is Nirvana. Nirvana is the pure Dharmakaya of the Tathagata. To realize the pure Dharmakaya of the Tathagata is the one vehicle. The Tathagata is not different from the Dharmakaya. The Tathagata is the Dharmakaya. The realization of the ultimate Dharmakaya is the ultimate one vehicle. The ultimate one vehicle is that which is apart from ordinary continuity. How is that? World honored one. If one says 
that the abiding time of the Tathagata is immeasurable, equal to the boundless future, and that the Tathagata can benefit the world with limitless compassion and limitless vows, that person is said to speak well. If one says that the Tathagata is permanent, is an unending dharma, and is the ultimate refuge of all sentient beings, that person is also said to speak well. Therefore, the Tathagata, the worthy one, the supremely enlightened one, is an inexhaustible refuge, an ever-abiding refuge, an ultimate refuge for an infinite length of time stretching into the future in a world without any protection, without any refuge. Okay, I'm gonna pause there. Okay, I'm just gonna pause there because I did mention, she, I should say, Srimala mentioned one idea that I wanted to talk a little bit about tonight. We have plenty of time. So that idea that got mentioned was, and let me just repeat the line exactly. So it was part of the idea that um, when she's speaking about how there's these two knowledges of ending samsaric existence, when she's speaking of the Tathagata's knowledge of having ended samsaric existence, she says the Tathagata's have vanquished with their harnessing and subduing power, the four Maras. They transcended all worlds and it goes on and on and on. But I wanted to pause because that's sort of, that's an, another idea. So the four Maras is, it's a kind of a really, I mean, frankly, it's actually an idea that I associate more with Vajrayana Buddhism than Mahayana Buddhism. But I've already mentioned that this, this sutra is, kind of like borderline Vajrayana. And in fact, a lot of the ideas are where Vajrayana comes from. So on that note, I, because you may not have come across these idea of the four Maras, I just wanted to pause on them for a moment. A, because Srimala doesn't, she kind of assumes that you, you know the four Maras. But then in doing this, when I review these four, let's keep in mind that a Tathagata vanquishes the four Maras, right? By harnessing and subduing through their harnessing and subduing power. So Mara, of course, is a classic figure within the world of Buddhist mythology or Buddhist cosmology. And the idea is, is that Mara is sometimes called the evil one, Papian, um, Mara, the that word, that name actually means death. And Mara is effectively death personified. At least that's how it seems in the early Buddhist tradition. And of course, you probably know of Mara, the classic traditional version of Mara, as the evil one or the being, the evil being, that the Buddha defeats sitting under the Bodhi tree. The classic story, of course, is the idea that Mara, who is kind of the overseer of samsara, by the way, <laughs> samsara is sort of Mara's realm. Because remember, samsara is the realm of birth and death and rebirth and birth and death and rebirth and birth and death and rebirth. And, and, rebirth. and a big part of that is death. And that's Mara. And so in the classic story of Siddhartha, the, the classic story of Buddhism, the Buddha defeats Mara, who first tries to dissuade the Buddha from his enlightenment by slinging a thousand arrows at the Buddha, trying to basically scare him using fear and the Buddha presents the fearlessness mudra, the abhaya mudra, and the arrows turn to flowers and rain over his body. And so he defeats fear. He defeats that aspect of Mara. Then Mara manifests um, these sort of dancing girls that try to 
tempt the Buddha out of his meditation by using sensuality. And the Buddha gives them the mudra of dana or giving or generosity, which is the, the mudra, the hand down like that. And that the idea is, is rather than taking what these women are offering, the Buddha actually presents them with a gift. And so for in that way defeats sensual temptation or kama in that way. And then the third temptation of Mara under the tree is vanity, in which Mara tries to basically provoke the Buddha into defending why he should be able to escape samsara. And by then defending himself, the idea is that he would fall into like a vain trap of, well, a trap of vanity in that way. And so rather than speaking on his own behalf, the Buddha does the mudra of the bumi, bumi sparsha, the touching the earth mudra, right? And upon touching the earth with his hand, the goddess of the earth, Gaia, appears and actually um, vouches for the Buddha and says, I have a memory that contains all ages and I've seen this bodhisattva pursuing enlightenment. And so I can vouch for him that he can escape uh, samsara. All the while the Buddha is just sitting there. And upon that, the Buddha defeats Mara and achieves nirvana, escapes samsaric existence and all of that. And that's kind of the original classic story of Mara, that Mara is that personification of fear death, the personification of sensuality, the personification of delusion, the personification of the kleshas, the personification of all of that. And the Buddha defeats all of that. That's the idea. In Mahayana Buddhism here, and again, this is sort of like later Mahayana Buddhism moving towards a Vajrayana, this tradition, Mahayana slash Vajrayana, they talk about four Maras. They talk about the Klesha Mara, the Skandha Mara, the, the Mercu, I cannot pronounce this word, the Mercure Mara, the Death Mara, and then the Deva Putra Mara, the Godling Mara. And these are these four very interesting ways of thinking about Mara in the Mahayana tradition. And what I mean by that is, is that if you take the first two, the, the Klesha Mara. So the Kleshas are, are what this sutra has been talking all about. This sutra has been talking all about the defilements. Defilements are Kleshas. And so when they talk about the Mara of the Kleshas, they're talking in the, about the Mara, Mara of the defilements of the mind. And so that's sort of talking about a, a Mara within, that Mara is part of us insofar as our minds are defiled by greed, anger, delusion, attachment to views, all of that. All of those defilements that defile our mind are considered a kind of devil within, a Mara within. Also, they talk about the skandha mara. If you remember, the skandhas are the five skandhas, the five aggregates, the body of form, sensations of sensory organs, perception, our conditioning, and our very conscious state, our very vinyana. Those are the five skandhas, and they say that those are a form of mara. Think about that for a while, right? And so those two, the Klesha Mara and the Skandha Mara, are kind of ways of seeing oneself as being a aspect of Mara in that way, or having Marish, Marish tendencies in that way, right? The last two are more of the kind of external Mara. The first one, the Mara that is death is that personification of the very idea of dying, the death itself, the, the kind of the grim reaper that comes and takes you away 
that's that Mara that whose name means death, right? And then the fourth Mara, the Devaputra Mara, the godling Mara, that one's kind of a tricky one. It really depends on the source that you look at for that. In some sources, this is the idea of Mara as like a, a judge of souls in the afterlife. So, uh, who, so this Mara kind of has like a godlike status and sort of judges people's souls in that way. So it's still a god of death and dying, but more on the other side, so to speak. The other interpretation, though, of this is that Mara is not a bad person. We've got it all wrong. <laughs> sort of, kind of. <laughs> And so there's this aspect of Mara that is a godling in that way. So there's just kind of two different takes on that. Um, but those are the ideas of the four Maras. And again, I want to remind you that what Srimala told us was that a Tathagata, with that Vajra-like wisdom of a Buddha, vanquishes all four of these Maras. And so the kleshas, the defilements of greed, anger, and delusion, gone. Attachment to the skandhas, attachment to this configuration of form and sensory organs and perception and conditioning and conscious states, attachment to the skandhas, gone. Fear of death and dying, gone. Caring at all about the afterlife, gone. <laughs> That's what it means to have ended samsaric existence. You're not worried about afterlife. You're not worried about dying. And you've overcome attachment to the self or the body in that sense and overcome the questions. Anybody got any questions, comments, answers, ideas about the Maras? What's going on in the Sutra? All right. It's one of those nights. That's, that's cool. I can hang with that. Yeah, no. Well, I'm, I don't, I have, it's a question. Is this related to Shmila, Shmila Deva Devi was saying that the Arhats and the Pratekya Buddhas haven't, un, haven't overcome the underlying Klesha of, of ignorance, and and we were talking last week about how that was related to them being like leaving the world rather than being in the world. Is that related to to this being the, the four Maras versus the one Mara? Um, I probably wouldn't suggest no. trying to cram that together. Okay. Yeah, because you remember this is a section. It is a section contrasting the the enlightened state of a tathagata with the enlightened state of the arhats and it sort of throws in there that a tathagata has defeated defeated all four maras and it doesn't really give us a compliment to that on the arhat pratikya buddha side so i wouldn't overthink it too much in that way yeah thanks i think the the bigger point and again, this is all at this point, deep commentary interpretation. You know, we're not, um, what I'm about to say is very interpretive. It's not in the text, but there's definitely from, especially from other Mahayana sutras that have this same kind of message. The sense is, is that, well, let's take the Arhat to begin with. So the Arhat, is sort of seemingly being critiqued by Srimala and by other Mahayana sutras, because in that path, one reaches a state of arhatship and claims the state of an arhat and basically is, is done. They're like, I did it, guys, I made it. And the hardcore Dharma heads are sitting over here going, it doesn't sound like it because you're still bragging about your accomplishments. So there seems to be this idea that, and, and by the way, I'm kind of paraphrasing chapter nine, I think, of the Vajra Sutra, 
The Vajra Sutra critiques the idea of being a stream enterer, once returner, non returner, or arhat, and actually talks about the idea of like, could an arhat even claim to have be an arhat? Because it would seem that the moment they claim arhatship, they have demoted themselves from the level of arhat. That's kind of, I think, the reasoning that that Srimala is giving here. And then the same thing, of course, is true of the Pratekya Buddha. They're claiming the state of a Buddha. They're claiming the state of an enlightened one. And I think the idea is, is that any claiming of any completing of this, again, is just you're outing yourself as having not completed it in that sense. So I would kind of read the, the shortcoming in that way. All right. Um, Shall we go further? Great. Um, oh, oh, though I did want to mention, though, I did want to mention, because I didn't really pause there, and I really kind of meant to, we heard the explicit definition of the lion's roar, right? And I'll repeat it for you in case you didn't catch it, but what is the lion's roar? The lion's roar is... Da -ka -da -ka -da. I have ended my rebirths. I have fully cultivated pure conduct. I have done what should be done. I am no more subject to samsaric existence. That's the lion's roar. So, and she's again saying that really only a Tathagata can make that claim of having ended samsaric existence in that way, because of course she goes on to say that the, or actually she doesn't say it, but she implies Arhats and Prateki Buddhas do not make the lions roar. They cannot make the lions roar because they haven't truly ended their samsaric existence. So I just wanted to mention that this sort of tease of the lions roar gets fully laid out right there in chapter five. Okay. Continuing with this idea that the Arhat and Pratekya Buddha don't, don't really escape samsaric existence in that way, she goes on to say, um, sorry, I thought that looked familiar. Okay, actually, no, we're still, we're, we're on the one vehicle part. This is where, right after she's giving all of these equations, where the Mahayana is the one vehicle, is the Tathagata, the Tathagata is the Dharmakaya, the Dharmakaya is the one vehicle. How could there be any difference, right? Because we're talking about indivisibility, right? And so she goes on to say that the Dharma is the path of the one vehicle. The Sangha is the assembly of the three vehicles. However, the Dharma and the Sangha are partial refuges, not ultimate refuges. How's that? Although the path of the one vehicle is taught, it is no longer mentioned after one has attained the ultimate Dharma Kaya. Because they have fear, those in the assemblies of the three vehicles take refuge in the Tathagata and learn and practice the Dharma. They are still in the active process of working towards supreme unsurpassable enlightenment themselves. Therefore, the two refuges are only limited refuges, not ultimate refuges. When sentient beings are subdued by the Tathagata and take refuge in the Tathagata, their thirst is relieved by the nectar of the Dharma, and they generate faith and joy. Consequently, they take refuge also in the Dharma and the Sangha. These two refuges are conceived as refuges because of sentient beings' faith generated through the quenching of their thirst by the nectar of the Dharma. 
the Tathagata is not such a refuge. The Tathagata is a true refuge. Nevertheless, in terms of the ultimate truth, to take refuge in the Dharma and the Sangha is to take ultimate refuge in the Tathagata. How's that? The Tathagata is not different from the two refuges. The Tathagata is all three refuges. And why is the path of the single ekyayana, the single vehicle taught? The Tathagata, the Supreme One, is endowed with the four fearlessnesses and is able to make the true lion's roar. If the Tathagatas, in accordance with sentient beings' needs, teach the two vehicles as an upaya, as a skillful means, then the two vehicles they teach are no other than the Mahayana, the great vehicle. Because in the highest truth, there are no two vehicles. The two vehicles both merge into the one vehicle, and the one vehicle is the vehicle of supreme dharma. World Honored One, when Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas reach the initial realization of the Four Noble Truths, it is not with the one supreme knowledge that they eradicate the underlying defilements, realize the merits of complete knowledge of the Four Noble Truths, or understand the essence of the Four Noble Truths. World Honored One, they lack the super mundane knowledge. So the four knowledges of the four truths come to them gradually, each conditioning the next. We're a honored one. The super mundane knowledge, like a Vajra, is not gradual in nature. World honored one. The Shravakas and Pratyakya Buddhas eradicate the underlying defilements by knowing the noble truths in many ways, but they do not possess the supreme, super mundane knowledge. Only the Tathagata, the worthy one, all knowing one, can break up the shells of all defilements. By, in, by the inconceivable knowledge of emptiness. It is beyond the domain of the Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas. World Honored One, the ultimate knowledge which shatters the shells of defilements is called the supreme super mundane knowledge. The initial knowledge of the noble truths is not the ultimate knowledge. It is the knowledge only leading to supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment. World Honored One. The true meaning of the word arahat, ara, arya, noble, does not apply to those who follow the two vehicles. How's that? The Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas are said to be noble merely because they can attain a small part of the merit of the Tathagata. World Honored One, the real noble truths are not truths belonging to Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas and are not merits that belong to them. The real noble truths are realized only by a Tathagata, a worthy one, a perfectly enlightened one, and afterwards revealed, demonstrated, and explained to sentient beings in the world who are confined in shells of ignorance. Hence the name Noble Truth. Michael, I find it always so interesting. It's just a general comment is when you read um, these sutras and explanations around that, that you, you know, the mind um, quickly gets attached to a line, you know, like, oh, yeah, this it is. And then the next line is like, oh, 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 it's not, you know, and then 
it like it it really breaks through any kind of attachments mm -hmm. that you have to a teaching right and yeah and i i found this is sometimes it's a little bit to be honest with you, a little bit frustrating or disappointing you know like really um and then anyway it's just and you see that in this sutra as well right it builds up and it builds up and then oh you have the sangha don't take refuge in sangha and no drama but eventually you take because it's won <laughs> and then you know so anyway just a comment great comment great observation connie yeah, no. Yeah, along those lines, <laughs> I felt like it, there was a moment there where she was saying, you, you know, there is no gradual realization of enlightenment. Like you can't just like go step by step and get there. And then later she was saying you can. So is that just a, a Connie instance <laughs> or or did I misunderstand? I mean, I almost felt like she was saying, like, yeah, you can, you can, you know, get close, but to get there is like, it's just an instance. It's not a sum of things you've done or realized. Yes. So, yeah, for, so both Noam and Connie, I, I totally, I really now understand Connie's comment more hearing Noam's uh, comment. Yeah, I think, I think what it is, is, so first of all, on that idea of that there's no gradual, that's, of course, another aspect of this idea of Vajra, is Vajras are instantaneous, sudden, like a lightning bolt in that way. It doesn't build up, it just appears. And that's very much in the vein of this sutra. I think one of the things is, is like, just in terms of... Um, First thing is, in terms of like a logical consistency, this sutra, what Sri Mala is doing is, remember at the beginning, I said this Vajra idea is about indivisibility. And so what she's doing is hammering any form of division and just wanting to weld it right back into a unity, into a oneness. And so there's a way where she's exercising some serious pranya in that way where it, nothing, nothing escapes this. And if at any moment we've made anything dualistic, we've sort of fallen back into that. And so we have to constantly be, if we, if we wanna understand Vajra, we wanna understand this, then we have to constantly be aware of that bifurcation in all of its various ways, big and small, and then read her comments in that mode or that line where she's really trying to be not trying she is being very consistent in in what she's saying now the implications of that regarding what, what noam just said with uh, uh, the idea of that gradual you know this is a big debate within the world of buddhism i don't even usually wade into these waters of the debate about sudden versus gradual enlightenment I feel a little obliged here to mention it. I'll give you the, a great example. It's a Zen, it's a classic Zen way of, um, of uh, getting out of this argument. Um, but the analogy that I really enjoy regarding the debate about gradual versus sudden enlightenment, the analogy in, the, in, a, in a Zen tradition is that they say, well, it's like a... Um, a piece of fruit on a tree. It takes days and months for that fruit to ripen. But the moment it falls to the ground is sudden. That doesn't happen gradually. There is actually a moment when it drops. And there you kind of get the best of both worlds where it's a, it's a gradual process, but enlightenment because of its extraordinary nature it's truly extraordinary not out not it's outside the ordinary it can only be instant but the work getting there is gradual that would be my again my answer to that by the way so by the way we just cruised through chapter six just like that um it's the actually i if i didn't mention it the 
later Bodhi Ruchi version of 800 from the heap of jewels doesn't have chapter breaks. It's one big long sutra. I've written in the chapter breaks. So I was like, oh, we're moving into chapter six now. Um, so that's good because we're making progress. I want to go back though to something super, super, super important that got mentioned. So the one of the reasons why I was so excited to do this sutra is this sutra is almost explicitly, it's definitely implicitly, but it's almost explicitly saying something that I'm often saying. And that is that when, you know, everybody knows I'm kind of um, part historian in that way where I really approach teaching Dharma from a historical point of view. And I am often saying that early Buddhism from like the year 500 BC for the first three or 400 years, maybe, Buddhism was a very, seemingly, I wasn't there, I'm basing obviously all of this on sources, but it seems to have been a very austere, very stoic meditation cult. It was a cult in that they were deeply reverential towards this Buddha figure guru person, and they were meditators. And that's what they did. And whether it was sexuality or whether it was in, you know, any, any defilement, the answer was meditation, long, long periods of meditation with a goal of being sort of clear, almost kind of in a, in a Scientology way where you are sort of emotionally neutral. You don't get worked up. You're, you're kind of just really, really, really even keeled because of all that meditation. I'm often saying though that Buddhism over time, not overnight, but over time became less of a severe meditation cult and moved more towards being what I would call a wisdom tradition. Meditation was still a part of it, but the focus was more on the wisdom, on this idea that if you could really understand a few key things here, you'll actually do the practice almost spontaneously. You will observe the precepts almost spontaneously. Nobody will actually even need to tell you not to lie. You wouldn't even really dream of lying in that way if you understood the wisdom. Harming other beings, again, there's a way in which from the wisdom you would naturally do the precepts. You would naturally move towards tranquility, desire tranquility in that sense of that a, a good long meditation session is a good night, like that idea, right? So I'm always saying that, that Buddhism moved from a hardcore meditation cult to a wisdom tradition. And the Vimali, or sorry, the, the Sri Mala Devi Sutra is saying that almost explicitly that the Shravakas and the Pratekya Buddhas are living in the past. And if you could just eliminate the underlying defilement of ignorance, since it's the breeding ground of all other defilements, they'll, those will all be cut off. So let's just work on that underlying defilement of ignorance. That being the case, I want to draw your attention to a very, very important line. So first of all, yeah, Michael, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. But what I'm, I'm missing a little bit here, or maybe I misunderstood it, you know, when you talk about from a, from a meditation cult to wisdom, like you didn't say that in that sense, but, you know, with all this wisdom, all the sutras, I mean, it's all, you know, beautiful and we learn, but at the end of the day, knowledge doesn't, is not the vehicle to enlightenment, right? Like knowledge, knowledge is knowledge. Knowledge is happening on a very, oftentimes on a very intellectual level. So, um, mm. I don't know. I, I, I hear what you're saying, Connie. And I think that, yeah, I think it's about knowledge and action and their relationship. And so, yeah, knowledge isn't the, the, the be all, the end all in that sense, but it's the relationship between karmic action 
and then knowledge. And I, again, I, my feeling about early Buddhism is that it was sort of, I, I use the word stoic, but it seems to be, a, um, and this is a bit based on the prescriptions and on the practices, that it's a very like um, controlling practice, the early practice. It's a very, um, um, I would almost call it a practice of repression in that way, that you get better at repressing these feelings. And so the idea is anger will stop coming up because I'm better at repressing it to the point where it doesn't come up anymore because I've been so good at repressing it. And there's a way in which that'll, that'll work and it's a path, but there's also this way that through understanding a few things, in particular, the idea that I'm about to get to, which is the teaching of emptiness, by really tapping into that and really understanding it, it's almost as if the anger won't even come up anymore. Now, I'm not trying to, to say that this is a, um, like a panacea, this like cure-all in that way where it's just like, oh, all you need to do is understand emptiness and then you won't be angry anymore. I'm not saying that. I'm just getting it. Um, and, and really, this is really only my only point. In the early Buddhist tradition, it seemed like if you were good enough at repressing all of these defilements and you practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced, you would come to the realization of emptiness, the highest vipassana, the highest insight of shunya. But that was like at the end. And it seems like at a certain point, and it definitely it's kind of Sri Mala's mode, she's like, well, what if we start with the wisdom? What if we started with the emptiness thing and kind of worked our way out of from there rather than waiting till the end to have this realization? And so it's just sort of a shift in perspective in that way. So, all right, everybody good? Okay, I just again wanted to say this again. So the first thing that Srimala does is, and when I was reading this, by the way, originally in Chinese, it was like, she drops this little, uh, where's the first time she says it? It's this, um, this idea of breaking up the shells. And, and in Chinese, the, the, the character for shell, it kind of jumped right out at me. And I was like, whoa, what's she talking about? What's this sh like shells of ignorance? So interesting. And so then she says it once, and then she says this really important thing. Only the Tathagata, the worthy one, the, all, all, the all-knowing one, can break up the shells of all defilements through the inconceivable knowledge of emptiness. Then she says, that's beyond the domain of the Shravakas and Pratekyabhutas. So that's a very, and then of course, she says the thing about shattering the shells. And then finally, she concludes her metaphor where she says this beautiful thing about after the Tathagata has fully realized the Four Noble Truths, then afterwards, it's revealed, demonstrated, and explained to sentient beings in the world who are confined in shells of ignorance. So here we are confined in our shells of ignorance, and the only thing, according to Sri Maladevi, that can shatter the shells of our ignorance is this Vajra-like wisdom of emptiness. And so she finally delivers it. She finally says it very explicitly that it is the knowledge and understanding of emptiness. That's it. Like, that's what does it. And Everybody who comes to Dharma doors knows I, emptiness. That's uh, we talk about emptiness all the time. I'm a Sri Mala Devi type of a Buddhist where I believe that if you can really understand emptiness, a lot of the practice flows very naturally from that place. Um, and so, yeah, so I won't really attempt <laughs> this late in the game to. Uh, explain emptiness. I, I do it often in that way. 
But I just want you to be thinking about how an understanding of that would, like a Vajra, just cut through it all in that way. Right. Questions, comments, answers, ideas. Anything come up? All right. Well, then I think if everybody can. Yeah. Ah. I'll do this. This actually has been working out for me. <laughs> Even though I didn't intend to do this, to do this, this series on Srimala, the Srimala Sutra, it's worked out that I've sort of been able to, at the end of each session, introduce the idea that will be talked about next week. And so this is sort of perfect because we're about to get at what is considered the central teaching of this sutra. Um, and so let's get to it. It will pop up. It does pop up for the first time in chapter seven. Chapter seven is a very small little chapter. So we're going to actually do another chapter tonight, which is awesome. So after this revelation about what breaks up the shells of ignorance, Sri Mala goes on to say, World Honored One, the real Four Noble Truths are very profound, very subtle, very difficult to perceive, hard to understand, and not to be discriminated. They are beyond the realm of thought and speculation, and they transcend the credence of all worlds. They are known only to a Tathagata, worthy one, perfectly enlightened one. How so? These truths explain the very profound Tathagata Garbha, the Tathagata embryo or the Tathagata, the womb, the womb of Tathagata. The Tathagata Garbha, the Tathagata embryo belongs in the realm of the Buddha and is beyond the domain of the Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas. Since the Noble Truths are explained on the basis of the Tathagata Garbha, the Tathagata embryo. And since the Tathagata Garbha is profound and subtle, the noble truths are also profound and subtle, difficult to perceive, hard to understand, and not to be discriminated. They are beyond the realm of thought and speculation and transcend the credence of all worlds. They can be known only by a Tathagata, a worthy one, a perfectly enlightened one. End of chapter six, seven, end of chapter seven. So there you have it. Srimala has just introduced what most people consider to be the central theme of this sutra, which is the Tathagata Garbha. They translate it as the Tathagata embryo. What is Diana Paul translated as? Let's find out. She translated to, oh, nice. So she keeps it full Sanskrit, Tathagata Garbha. No translation. So that's great. So, really quickly, this sutra, of course, has been talking all about the Tathagata. Since the beginning, it's been talking about the merit of the truth of the Tathagata. And from the beginning, I've been saying, yes, Tathagata means a Buddha, but this is not the Buddha. This is a very different sense of Tathagata. And then we've seen that only a Tathagata gets rid of the underlying defilement of ignorance. Only a Tathagata can make the true lions roar. So this sutra is about extolling this idea of Tathagata. 
And then Srimala just introduced us to this very Mahayana Buddhist idea. It, in fact, it doesn't get any more Mahayana Buddhist than the idea of the Tathagata Garbha. Now they translate it as um, this one as the embryo of the Tathagata, Tathagata embryo. And well, I mean, I almost don't want to say too much because this is one of those situations where what Sri Mala has done is sort of drop this little idea out there. And you're supposed to be wondering, wait, what, if, what is that? What did she mean by that? Because it's a really weird phrase, by the way. So again, it's Tathagata, which is that idea of a Buddha, but it's very, very helpful. And I haven't done it tonight to remember that Tathagata means arising out of thusness or suchness, tathata, pure presence, tathagata. And then this contraction, pardon the expression, but this term tathagata garbha, and a garbha is a womb. All I, I wanna say, because we're basically out of time, is I said it at some point, how feminine this sutra is. We came across that wonderful, beautiful phrase at a certain point, Dharma, mother of the world, that one who embraces the true Dharma is a protector, most compassionate, a Dharma mother of the world. And that's sort of just one of the way super explicit kind of feminine aspects to this sutra. There are many, it's almost just in the way that it's written in that sense. And so now we come across this very feminine idea as well as of the, the womb, the womb of Buddhahood, the Tathagata Garbha. I'm just gonna leave it at that, that basic idea of a Tathagata Garbha. What could that possibly mean? You'll have to wait until next Sunday for part nine when we get back into the Srimala Devi Sutra. So on that note, I'm going to call it a night. Thank you all so much. That's it. <laughs>